Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 60, 6, 0. I'm going to look at verse 1 and 2 today. You know, we wear different hats in life, you know, sometimes uh, we have different jobs we have to do. We raise our children and uh, we have jobs in the ministry and responsibilities. We have jobs around the house. We have honey-do list. It's always important to have the right tools. I found this to be true. I also found that whatever goes around comes around. I remember as a kid, I would always borrow my dad's tools, but I would never put them back. So every project he had where he needed the tools, half the time he was looking for the tools. That actually is happening to me right now. It's a very real thing. It's a very painful thing. But you gotta have the right tools. Nine years ago, almost to the week, I drove up to the mountains here with my family. I drove a Crown Vic, a Ford Crown Vic. My my kids made fun of me because I like driving that car. Now I have uh, a Ford F-150 pickup. I'm more like a mountain guy. I was a city guy, now I'm more like a mountain guy. I didn't have a beard, now I have a beard. I used to go off places to go hunting. Now I shoot deer in my backyard. It's great. Um, I bought a wood splitter the other day. And I got to tow it home on my truck. I'm becoming like a mountain person. Yeah. I, I didn't say Clemson fan, I said mountain person. So, so uh, I don't know, I don't know. I just know that you gotta have the right tools. So, I think about my job, and one of my jobs is preaching. So I say to myself, what's my tool? I only have one tool, really. And, and that one tool is this book. Now, like any other tool in the toolbox, I can misappropriate this tool, use it in the wrong way. I can. I can use it for something it's not supposed to be used for. I don't want to do that. But I, I've been looking at this piece of equipment here as it pertains to 2018. And, and I've been thinking about what is it that I'm going to build and how am I going to use this tool? And I'd encourage you in the, in the span of the next 30 or so minutes to be asking yourself the same question. What are you going to build in 2018 And how are you going to use this tool? And is it readily available to you and easy to find? Okay, so I've been looking at this book, and I'm thinking, I've been thinking about this for weeks, months. In 2018, for me personally, for my personal job to build my own life, my own family, personally speaking, I'm going to use this tool to get further acquainted, really acquainted, with not only the life of Jesus, but the life of Abraham. I'm going to, if you ask me 365 days from now, most anything you want to know about Abraham, I'd be your guy to ask. He will be the guy that I kind of follow on his pilgrimage, on his travels. I'll look at the cities he went to. My devotions will be centered around his his life, his enemies, his conflicts, his family matters, his decision-making, his faith, his righteousness, his worship, all of those things. That's what I do. I, I don't... I mean, I'm different. I don't, I don't go through a devotional as much as others do. There's nothing wrong with that. But I just like to latch on to one guy, or I've done this with David before. I've done it with Elijah. This happens to be Abraham for me this year. How, what will God teach me through the life of Abraham? So I'll go over and over it again. That's how I'm going to use this tool on a personal level, okay? But how are you going to use this tool on a personal level? That's the question I have for you this morning. What are you going to build and how are you going to use this tool? All right, second thing. Um, This tool is different than any other tool. It has its own smell and it's got its own sound, it's got its own feel. Um, If this tool is special to you, it's it's something you cherish and it's something you keep very close. This will help me make decisions. This will help me avoid conflict. This will help me through conflict. This will encourage me when I'm down. This tool right here, can, can tweak my attitude. It can penetrate my soul, even dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It can get deep down into my issues, 
yeah, this will change the way I think, the way I feel, the way I act, the decisions that I make, I don't make, how I interact with people, how I don't interact with people, how I overcome sin, hardship, selfishness. It's all in this book. This tool right here, this is what I need. It's what I need for my job, my vocation, but it's what I need to live, and it's what you need to live. How are you going to use this tool? That's the first thing I want you to, to think about. I was working with someone the other day, and we were working side by side, and I asked a question, which I, I ask often, if most people don't think it's my business, but actually it is my business. I, I said, how's your walk? And uh, I ask this often of people, and, and, and the person's response was, my, my prayer life's not what it should be. So immediately this person, nothing wrong with this, compared or contrasted his prayer life to what it used to be or someone else's or what he read about or something. Some comparison or some contrast he went on and his conclusion was it's not what it's supposed to be. That's great. That's a great understanding. So now the question is to that person who's sitting here today, how would you use this tool to build a prayer life in 2018? I didn't say New Year's resolution. What I'm talking about is using a tool like this to chart a course that takes a whole entire year to accomplish it. Now that's something worth doing. Because a New Year's resolution that peters out sometime around Valentine's Day is, is just another effort that was made that left us less than what we expected of ourselves and further from the very target we wanted to pursue to begin with. What's your tool and what's your destination? Now I'll go on to say another thing. And this all came together for me about two, about a week ago, talking to my wife and my daughter. It all came together for me. I've been trying to articulate it, and finally, God just, boom, there it is. There's two words, three words, actually, that will become a focal point of my job of teaching and preaching using this tool. This three words, three words that haven't been diluted yet, they haven't been ruined yet, they haven't been discarded yet, and they're just unknown enough in the depth of their definition that they're intriguing enough for people to latch onto, hold onto, and maybe do something with. Three words, first one is pilgrim. How will I use this tool to be a pilgrim, to define pilgrim, to act as a pilgrim, and to have others and influence others to lead them to act as a pilgrim. That's number one. Number two is pilgrimage. How as a pilgrim will I be on a pilgrimage in 2018 that will take me from a beginning point to an ending point, may take all year to do that, that takes preparation, decision-making, discernment to know what to take on the journey, what to leave behind. I don't have to go geographically on this pilgrimage, but I'm on a pilgrimage. It might be geographic, I don't know yet. I might be my own little Abraham experience, I don't know yet. But I am interested in leading people who understand themselves to be pilgrims on a pilgrimage that has a beginning, a middle, and an end that's difficult, that's worthy of taking, and certainly worth reaching the destination. The third word that I'm interested in, in my job, you have your own, is the word sojourner. How is it that I will use this tool in my own life, my family's life, and my ministry to have pilgrims go on pilgrimages and have people act like sojourners? That's what I'm interested in. Now, I'm not necessarily you know, trying to tell you what to do, but I'm thinking you, as someone who has a job to do, multiple jobs, one has to pick the right tools. Two has to be about accomplishing something. Faith without works is dead. And do it in a such a way that you as a couple, you as a family, we as a church, you as an individual, whatever the case may be, has a starting point, a middle, and an end. That one cannot attempt nor accomplish on their own, in their own flesh. Now that's a year worth living. My daughter went to New York the other day and um, because she was, I uh, went to see Jimmy Fallon at the Late Show, I obviously was in bed. My wife was obviously watching and recording this whole experience to watch an hour long show to see if we could get maybe six, seven seconds of our daughter in the audience. I think we got five seconds. But there was a comedian on the show and he said, uh, he said something very profound. He says, I'm in touch with something right now. I got about 30 summers left. 
He goes, that's a real number. I thought, wow, this dude, his job is to make me laugh and he's making me cry right now. He said, I got 30 summers left. I thought, well, probably not off that much. How many summers left do you have? And where does 2018 play into all that strategy? Is there a pilgrimage that begins this year and goes on for years in the 15 more summers you have? Who knows? I don't know. All I know is you've got to have this tool. You've got to have the right tools. That brings us now to Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 and 2. A prophecy to Israel at the time, but also a prophecy to us. A foreknowledge of the coming of Christ. It goes like this. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Wow. it's quite a statement. He said, see, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Fascinating. What it mean at this? Arise, shine, for your light has come. The word arise. Atlanta Falcons got a hold of this. Uh, you can watch the game at 425 today on Fox, playoff-worthy uh, football game. But their, their slogan is rise up, rise up. Actually, it's brotherhood. In brotherhood, rise up. So they got a political statement there. But rise up. What does that mean? Same thing Isaiah saying. Rise up. In Hebrew, it means stand up. Meaning what? You weren't standing up. You were sitting down. Meaning you weren't really going anywhere. You were just sitting. Israel is just sitting. Question, are you sitting? How's your walk? Rise up. Arise. It means to stand up and to become powerful. What does that mean? It means you're sitting down and you're not as powerful, powerful as you could be. So the two things beg the question here. Can you stand up and can you inherit a little power? A little power for the journey. That's what he's saying. Become more powerful. And he said, persist to be proven. This is a great system uh, statement. Persist to be proven. Can you and I in 2018 rise up, arise, stand, become more powerful, and persist to be proven? Here it is. The Christian in this culture, in this millennium, right here, right now, has to persist to be proven. We're not a, we're not a Christian nation anymore. Get past that, please. We have to persist to be proven. We have to be consistently operating with integrity. We have to be counted on, trustworthy, proven to be there in times of trouble. You and I need to rise up in 2018 as a church, even further than we have, and boy, have we come a long way, and we need to become even more powerful and persistent in being proven as loving people of full of grace with a message of hope. to be set and fixed. In 2018, I've got to figure out how this tool right here can tweak my heart and my mind in such a way that I can rise up as a man, as a husband, become even more powerful in Christ, and be fixated upon the glory of God and persist to be proven faithful in bringing him glory. Men. I don't know what your plan is, but that's God's plan. I don't know if you're sitting down, standing up, laying down, walking backwards. Men, how does this tool tweak your heart to execute a plan in your head that takes a year to even get to the, scratch the surface of something so meaningful in such a way that you persist to be proven faithful? Women, women of God. Listen, sometimes people need to hear this. Women of God. Listen to it. Women of God. Listen to it. Men of God. Counseling with someone on the phone the other day. This person is going absolutely crazy in the decision making that they're making. Crazy, crazy out of character stuff. 
failed to realize, failed to remember, failed to hold on to the identity that you are a man of God. And as a man of God, there are expectations to pursue holiness. You can actually lose that temporarily and with it lose your sanity and start making decisions that are so out of character of a man of God, but it happens. Woman of God. Do you hear that this morning? Woman of God. It just makes you want to persist to be proven worthy of the title of woman of God. It makes you want to be what? Holy. It makes you want to be whole, just hearing it. Let me raise the bar for you. You're called to be a woman of God. Young women, young daughters, you're called to be a woman of God, a wife of noble character. Don't be afraid to say it. It takes you to a rock higher than yourself. It raises the standard of mediocrity. It gives you something to pursue and pilgrimage toward that God himself will help you by his spirit. God wants men of God and women of God to think bigger than they are, and he'll help you to get there because he knows you can't get there on your own. Rise up. Be powerful, persist to be proven. Build something, arise, shine. To become or be light, to eliminate, to kindle, like a candle, to kindle of face-to-face shining one on another. I don't know what day it was. It was a month or two ago. I was driving in the middle of uh, darkness towards the overlook. I come out of my neighborhood. Oh my gosh, what, there's a big, the moon was as big as the sky. Huh? There's a name for it. It took me back. I thought, who put that fake moon up there? It was real. This thing was massive moon. And I looked at it and I go, my gosh. Then I thank him. That thing has absolutely no ability to shine whatsoever. It is dust and it is rock and it is huge and it is floating in the air, but it has no light, no electricity, nothing, no radiance, nothing. It is in total darkness. Yet, that thing startled me as I came down 64, just startled me through the pines. I just looked at it and went, whoa, what is that? Because the sun over there in China is beaming down on some ocean and reflecting back up on this bundle of rock, I'm blown away by it. That's what you and I are. You're the moon. And the glory and the light of Christ shining on you reflects into other people's, it just kindles hearts. Persist to be proven, rise up. Shine, illuminate somebody's life. Use this tool to turn up the illumination, and in so doing, turn up the warmth. Pilgrimage towards that. Dimness is dangerous. I don't pretend to be the greatest deer hunter in the world, but I know this thing. You can sit in a deer stand for hours at a time and freeze to death for about a five-minute opportunity, whether it be in the morning or the night. It's the grossest... Uh, oversight in the history of the solar system, that a man will spend all that money on clothing and weaponry and travel and eating bad food to sit in a deer stand for a five-minute opportunity, either the sun's coming up or the sun's going down. And there's this five-minute opportunity between light and darkness where you can still see an animal in which to shoot it, or if you wait too long, You can't see anything, and you might be shooting your buddy. Or if you wait too early, you'll never see anything. It's crazy. All this so that the hair on your chest can grow another quarter inch and you can go back home feeling masculated again. (laughs) When you could just go to Lowe's and get a wood splitter. (laughs) The deer... They don't understand how dangerous dimness is. A deer sitting in the woods, starving. Hadn't been out all day. Needs to get up and move around a little bit. I'm hungry. Sun's going down, says, ah, you know what, I think, it's, I think it's safe now. Come on, let's go. It's dark enough. Or is it? 
Some people walk through their whole spiritual life in between light and darkness trying to decide, is it safe? Is it okay? Can I do this? Should I make a decision? We're people of light, not dimness. He doesn't call you to dimness. He calls you to light, illumination. Actually, the word shine actually means flood. God wants to flood your life so there's no shadows, not dimness. You can't associate, be associated with a church. You can't, you can't sort of be on the periphery and really expect any kind of brilliance and illumination and clarity and decisiveness and impact in people's lives. You gotta get in the middle of the game here, man, where the, where the light comes. Persist in proven to be persistent in your walk with Christ. Arise, shine, for the light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. The glory of the Lord. We sing it a lot, we say it a lot. What does it mean? Well, in Hebrew, it's this word, kabod. K-A-B-O-W-D, kabod. What is that? The kabod is the splendor of God and the reverence toward God and the fear of God and the weightiness of the presence of God. I was thinking, why do you enter his gates with thanksgiving? If God's everywhere, he's on both sides of the gate, how am I entering in all of a sudden to God when he's supposed to be on both sides? How do you take this tool and tweak the way that you think in such a way that you know that you're turning on a sensitivity towards God, you're focusing and fixating in on him, even for a few minutes a day, that's gonna sculpt and shape the direction of your entire day, week, month, and year, and life? Kaboom. But this has to be a misprint. It says, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. This is something that I fear we've totally missed in Christianity. Whenever we think of looking to God, we always look up. God's always up. Heaven's always up. Yeah, okay, but and why then would the glory of the Lord rise up to you? Seems like it would descend. As long as we're talking about Emmanuel, Christ, who descended even into the lower regions, who humbled himself, became a foot washer, the readiness and the availability of the Spirit of God, the presence of God, the glory of God in a person's life doesn't, isn't so far away you cannot even fathom it. It's right there with you and wants to come up like rivers of living water would well up within you. God is every bit present right now in your business, in your life, in your marriage, your decision making, your dreams, your aspirations, your education, everything right there. Wanting in the humblest of ways to make himself known to you from the bottom up. We need to rise up. He needs to rise up with us. The glory of God. Divine humility. And then Isaiah says, see, darkness covers the earth. If this isn't the most incredible no-brainer you've ever seen. Not only does darkness cover the earth, listen to this, and thick darkness. As if darkness wasn't enough, we have a thick, syrupy, molasses-like darkness is over the people's. Boy, is this true in our day and age? Oh my goodness gracious. What do people do when it's the darkest? What does the culture outside of Christ do in darkness? People in sin, people without Christ, cultures without God, the godless cultures, the false religions, they're all trying to do one thing in the midst of not only darkness, but thick darkness. What is that? Be seen. People want to be seen, they want to be affirmed, they want to be acknowledged, they want to be encouraged, they want to be accolades, the accolades of man, the flattery of man, the praise of man, the awards of man, the status of man, the riches of man. The greatest sign of spiritual immaturity is the need to be needed, the need to be seen, the need to be affirmed, the need to be accepted, the need to be seen in the midst of darkness. Eventually it exhausts it exhausts you and you can't do it enough anymore. You can't do it enough to be seen enough anymore in the midst of darkness. Making decisions in the dark can lead to some regrettable consequences. Back in the days before electricity, a tight-fisted old farmer was taking his hired man to task 
for carrying a lighted lantern when he went to call on his best girl. When he explained, why he explained, explained when I went a courtin', I never carried one of those things. I always went out in the dark. Yes, the hired man said Riley, and look what you got. When, when we get into, when we don't use this tool appropriately, not in some religious way, not in some dutiful way, but when we don't eat this and become more like the bread of life, when we don't digest this, when we don't meditate on this, when we don't find the freedom that this brings, when we don't find the life that this book brings and the power of the Spirit, when we go through religious activities, we end up getting dim, diluted, and down. And it's in that context that we, sometimes we make decisions that we feel like is going to compensate for that diluted nature. And they're usually really bad ones. Really bad. And we, we make a crisis out of our situation more than it actually is to put a deadline upon ourselves to make decisions to get out of this situation. It's always a new relationship, a new job, a new move, a new this, a new that. That's going to solve everything. We hurry up the pace because we no longer want to wait and be patient on God because we don't know where he is in the darkness we've created. And Isaiah says, arise, stand up, get powerful. Prove thyself to be trustworthy. Stand, seek power, shine. See where you're going, flood my life and bring a prayer of this book into your life in a, in a life-giving, authentic way that enriches you and gives you eyes to see and ears to perceive what his spirit is saying to you. That's a dangerous person in a darkened world. Luke 12 and, and three, what you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight and what you have whispered in the ear of the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. Sometimes we look back on a year and we say, it was a good year, or it wasn't so good. It was good and bad, and there were down times. Question, when there were down times, did it keep you from the Lord or draw you nearer? Do you know that some of the down times he allowed purposely to bring you and I back closer to him? Because that level of influence was needed. Where's, where's your walk? Arise and shine. Your, your light has come. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Three of the best words in the Bible. I went and did this, I went and did that, I'm feeling this way, I feel that way, I feel called to do this, I made this decision, I did this, I did that, but the Lord. But the Lord. The Lord, this is the greatest thing, one of the greatest things about God, he's not limited by you and me. But the Lord did this. Despite what I did, but the Lord did this. Despite what I did, but the Lord forgave me. But the Lord empowered me. But the Lord delivered me. But the Lord saved me. But the Lord healed me. But the Lord provided for me. I did some stupid things. I made some stupid decisions. I wasn't faithful in this, faithful in that. I, I ran out of my resources. I was at the end of my rope. But the Lord. But the Lord. You can sit and you can be deluded. You can walk in darkness. But the Lord. How's your walk? How's your private walk? How's your public walk? How's your prayer life? And the one thing, well, the one of two things that no Western congregation wants to hear. How's your fasting? And how is it life-giving and woven in your prayer life as the Lord Jesus would have it? We as a church will be fasting together in the month of February. The greatest antidote to excessiveness, extravagance, overspending, and gluttony 
is fasting. How's your generosity? Are you sharing the truth? Sharing love, sharing affection, sharing encouragement, sharing wisdom, sharing financially, sharing non-financially? Are you affirming? Are you speaking the love language of the person you came with? Are you providing them with affection and care and compassion and patience? How's your walk? You are a pilgrim, a person who journeys to a sacred place for religious reasons. What's that sacred place God's calling you to this year? And what does that journey look like? And what's needed for the journey and what is not? What direction do you have? And how does this book right here fit into the program? You are a sojourner, a person who resides temporarily in a place. I know it's a downer, but not everybody in this room right here will be in this room a year from now. Some of us will have gone on to glory. Each and every one of us are sojourners here temporarily. We're not permanent. What are we doing? How are we doing it? With whom are we doing it? Think this year, before this year gets behind us, of what preparation is needed for your journey, what motivation is needed, what destination are you headed towards, what mobilization and what execution will take place. I know it has to do with more of him and him removing obstacles and you and I praying dangerous prayers every now and again. Dangerous prayers. Dangerous because they're always answered yes. Dangerous prayers because when you're saying them, you're inside, you're shaken. Like, I can't believe I'm saying this. Lord, remove from me anything and anyone that keeps me from you. Take any possession away from me you so desire if it comes between me and you. Remove every idol from my life, whether I realize it or not. Bring me to places of humility I've never been before. Teach me to be patient more than ever before. Give me a faith that could move a mountain and redefine what faith is to me. Give me a love for another that is undeserving, unexpected, and inexplicable. Do something in me that I cannot do for myself and I lay down my life before you and give it all to you. No strings attached. How's your walk? How are you using this tool to build your Jerusalem, your Judea, your Samaria, and the ends of the earth? Let's pray. Fashion something in us, Lord Jesus the power of the Spirit that quickens us to rise, to stand, to shine, to prove ourselves faithful, an illumination and reflection of you in the midst of darkness and confusion, and keep us from such nonsense, for it's no longer needed. We pursue you and you alone. I pray that this year I'd laugh so hard my belly would hurt. I'd laugh so hard I'd cry. That someday this year I'd cause another to laugh so hard they couldn't stop. I pray for special moments, embraces, connection, intimacy, understanding with others that need no explanation. Pray for the mystery of the moment when all else is shut out and I'm leading another person to Jesus Christ. I pray for a peace that transcends all understanding and guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I pray for a direction, a start, a middle, and an end. And I pray for this book to penetrate my mind, my heart, my soul, my spirit. Take us to a rock that's higher than ourselves.
we proclaim this year to be the year of the Lord's favor and grace and abundance. Keep from me what I lack the maturity to handle and make me, Lord, more mature. Help me to dream, to aspire, that you would increase and we would decrease in life. And help us to treasure every summer we have, every fall, every holiday, every day, that you came that we have life and life more abundantly. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. One question before we close our service. Others may have told you this was going to be the year of your salvation. Others may have told you they've been praying for you to receive Christ. Others may have told you year after year after year that you're heavy on their heart, that you need to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Eh, it's funny. We're only about 12 hours away from the end of this year. Maybe they were right. Maybe in this service, today's the day of your salvation. Maybe today's the day that you say, you know what? I can't judge my walk because I don't have one. And I can't rise because I don't see for whom I'm rising. And I can't shine and reflect because I don't know them and I need to. If you're here this morning and you've never, I remember when I did this, if you've never received Christ, you've never invited him into your life, you've never taken him into your heart, you never asked for the forgiveness of your sins, and you feel like your life is, is, is dim and less satisfying than it could be, it is. It is. But it doesn't have to be. He is the light of the world. And he's who you've been looking for your entire life. And he can be received right now and manifested in your heart and change, not everything, everything now and everything that ever will be for all eternity. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ, then you walk with this perplexing dilemma of how to outperform the depths of your sin that can't be forgiven apart from his blood who was shed for the forgiveness of your sin. You walk with the, the actual fatigue of performing your way into an acceptance level that can't be attained because God desires perfection and provided his son as a sacrifice as payment of your sin and mine. And yes, you're happy at times, but never joyous. It's always conditional. And you want to connect with God, but heaven sometimes like brass. He says, I no longer call you servant, I call you friend. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you to have a relationship with the Father, and he provided the way for you to get to the Father, to have what it is you've been looking for your entire life. Acceptance, purpose, grace, love, mercy, forgiveness, wisdom, joy, and peace inexplicable. But you can't have that without Christ, because in Christ all those things reside and originate. Yeah, man. Today could be the day of your salvation. Unbelievable, but yet believable. So I'm going to ask you to do something. If you've never accepted Christ, I'm not asking about it, going to church and all that stuff. I'm just saying if you've never accepted Christ, personally, and I would even say publicly, I want to invite you to do so. I want to invite you to embrace and be embraced by this loving God. And I can't see half of you anyway, so if you've wanted to accept Christ, I just want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. would not want to do that. But I am going to pray for you. If you want to receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you've never done that before, I want to ask you to stand up so I can see you. We're going to pray for as a church for you. Is anyone here to receive Christ? I want you to stand up. We'll pray for you. Anyone? Okay. 
Good. Let's close in one more prayer. Father, we lift up Crystal Green and her family to you. And her father. I pray that you envelop them with closeness and a love to appreciate one another and to appreciate you. Lift up John and Betsy to you, Father, in their midst of their tragedy and ask you to provide for them and love on them. We lift up Don Harper before you, Lord, and ask you to put an end to his medical intervention and pain. Lift up Debbie Spritch to you, Father, and ask you to relieve her of her pain. Lift up Melanie Beavers to you, Lord, and ask you to take authority over all illness. We lift up every person in hurting, frustrated, lonely, disconnected. Fellowship with them, I pray. Let this be the year of the Lord's favor. We thank you in Jesus' name and the church said, amen.